G'day everybody and for those who are coming late, you're listening to X Band Podcast. He washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me, so evil doers will believe that this man cannot die. The man come. The ghost who walks. The man come. Enemies beware, the phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team, and this is X Band the Phantom Podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com, and you can contact us via our email, which is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. You can subscribe to us via YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or the various Android apps. This is episode 199, and it will bring us into the double century. And today we are going to be chatting with free creator Jason Paulus. My name is Jermaine, and today I am joined by Dan and Stephen. How are you two? Yeah, very good, Jim. Uh, school holidays have started. I've been to the zoo today, and uh, here I am in a Zoom meeting with uh, this bunch of animals. So looking forward to <laughs> the chat uh, with Jason today. Awesome. And Stephen, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. Um, we Ballarat's uh, locked down today, so that was nice, and the weather turned it on. So I um, cooked some wood fire pizzas and had a couple of ciders this afternoon. So things are all right. So tonight we're going to be, or today, as you listen to this, we're going to be uh, talking to Jason Paulus. Now, we we had Jason on in uh, episode 65 where we were uh, chatted with him and the other uh, Gaslight creator in Christian Secure. Uh, now, that was four years and close to 150 episodes previously. So we thought it might be good to have Jason back on because since then uh, he has created uh, three stories, including two part two, two parters, if you can get your head around that one, uh, which is uh, five full, full issues, plus all of the covers um, and gaslight stories that we have seen in publication. And uh, for those who have got the latest comic, uh, the latest couple of frues, there's some new gaslight uh, comics in there, which is the Grey Malican as well. So I'm sure we will talk to Jason about that. So hello, Jason. How are you? And welcome. Good. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> Happy to have you here. Week 13 in lockdown. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, feeling it. so for those who uh, don't know, uh, you live in uh, the western parts of um, Sydney and you're in lockdown. Uh, so how's that treating you? Yes, yeah, so I'm in the pointy end of the Blue Mountains in Blackheath. And um, yeah, homeschooling, isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> well you've got uh so Stephen and dan are both teachers so um oops yeah <laughs> <laughs> i feel your pain mate i've got my two young kids trying to you know remote schooling and then trying to teach remote schooling <laughs> uh, oh. it's it's not fun so hopefully for all those others that are in lockdown uh hopefully this will be a bit of fun and as we learn and talk learn a bit about jason and talk a bit about his career um and you can have some fun listening to us. So, Jason, to start us off, and for those who have come in late, <coughs> can you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your age, what you, a bit about your career, and then we'll kind of go from there. Ah, uh, okay. I saw what you did there. For those who came in late, that was good. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm 52. Okay, I'm yeah. not happy about that. Um, I would have not, I would have not picked that. Oh, stop. <laughs> oh, oh, look. Oh, yeah, mate. but that was just because of lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said to my missus before this, I said, oh, what do I do? I'm bald. Like, I don't care, but at the moment, I don't know, I don't want to be bald. And uh, <laughs> so I tried a couple of beanies and I had a rock and roll wig. <laughs> and um, I just thought, uh, treat you to my head, my phantom-esque head. <laughs> That's it, mate. You're nice rocking the billies. Fair at all? We don't know. <laughs> um. All right. So my my career sounds um. It's not really a career. It's just a hobby that just got out of control. You know? <laughs> I like that. It's all right. We're all yeah. sitting in our hobbies that got out of control as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's all around me, uh, as with you. So, um. 
I'm lo- I'm looking at my rack to show comics because I it's it's easier just to hold up comics, you know. Um, but of course, I'm not that organised. But anyway, all right. So uh, I I'm a trained graphic designer, and that's been my career for 20 25 years until about 10 years ago when I started freelancing for the drawing book agency in Sydney doing storyboards, which enabled me to quit my office job um, and hence facilitated the move from the city. Uh, but previous, you know, to the move, I was doing uh, desktop publishing and uh, and doing graphic design for annual reports for AMP and uh, Telstra and when they were called OTC back in the day. Uh, and, and I amassed a big pile of brochures and boring corporate shit. Um, but that was a good job because I, I could publish comics on the side, you know, and I used to photocopy and you would think I'd have some samples to show, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> they're here somewhere. So I used to photocopy my own comics on the work photocopier. And, um, <laughs> and then that progressed to... Uh, me getting my own comics on the newsstands through Gordon and Gotch, much like the Phantom, the same sort of process, except on a smaller scale. I printed, uh, you know, like uh, 3,000. I might have printed 10,000 comics at first, which is a terrible, terrible mistake (laughs) uh, because then you've got to throw them all away. Um, And eventually um, published a couple of dozen comics um, of, you know, self-published comics while working as a graphic designer. Uh, and then I, ha- I went, then I moved to London, did web design, uh, and we got a gig with Mad Magazine doing a regular oh. script for Australian Mad. Mm. Um, and I made contact with a few English uh, comic people when I lived in London for a couple of years. And then we moved back here, had kids 2000 and 2001, after September the 11th, we moved back to, to Sydney and, uh, and I'm from Brisbane, just incidentally. Well, I lived in Sydney for like 30 years and I uh, started working at the Christmas warehouse in Botany doing Christmas brochures uh, and all the while doing the comic thing on the side. And that's how I met Glenn Ford because he would take a back page ad on my comic. You mentioned um, Man Magazine. Uh, that was Hair, was it Hair Butt the Hippo? Hair Butt the Hippo, Private Eye. Yes. From memory, you've even, uh, one of the stories had a heavy uh, Phantom influence as well. No, we just, uh, we just had Hairbutt meets the Phantom in a mad episode and um, Hairbutt uh, uh, treks through the jungle to the deep woods and he comes upon the Phantom Cave. Phantom isn't home and he mistakes the Phantom Cave for a toilet so he shits on the throne oh. and then the Phantom turns up. At the end. <laughs> None too impressed, I guess. Got away with that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, this was, so this was like the 90s as well, yeah. Right, correct? Yeah. 92. No, yeah. Uh, yeah, mid 90s. There yeah. I, I remember hair, but from because um, I was the right age to be buying Mad magazines at that time. Well, you know, fifteen through to oh, seventeen, sort yeah. of thing, and um, worked in a news agent, so I was picking up the Mad magazines and uh, always enjoyed the hair, but series. Oh, was that? Yeah, 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 definitely. It's, oh. uh, when I um, you, you and I'm sure we'll talk all around all of this sort of stuff. But when your Kickstarter came out um, last year, year before, and and included, yeah. and that was the their hair butt collection, wasn't oh, it, well, uh, through your Kickstarter. But, yeah, certainly when I saw that come up and um, it was the collection of hair butt, the hippo, I was like, I remembered that from when I was a kid and reading it in the Mad Magazine. So was that was that also the hair butts? Was that the comic that you self-printed and, and got into news agents? No, that, they, they were done especially for Mad. It wasn't reprinted or anything. Right. Uh, different style, two-page gag format, and we did a the, – the guy writing it, uh, Bo Dean America and I did a hundred pages worth, and we did a few extra ones as well, which didn't make it in print. Oh, wow. so that was about two years of publication, yep. and then they got sick of it and then stopped. stopped right, printing. fair enough. But I, I think it still stands up. I'm super proud of the really intense cross hatching, detailed style, and it's it's what you know I call Bigfoot style, where it's sort of influenced by um, Robert Crumb and um, 
goofy 60s underground and newspaper strips you know so it's it, it's a style it's a humorous style which I, I can do as well as the more um uh i don't really do realistic stuff for the phantom but it's not it's not humorous you know it's not big noses and big feet and stuff so mm. and that, that's the stuff i first started doing though i well, did stuff I, is yeah i did i did draw dark nebula as well uh which um you know it's an aussie comic most people know it which was the more straight superhero style but even my superhero stuff was never really it never really fit into any sort of house style it wasn't really influenced by marvel or dc or anything particularly just talking about your style like what were you influenced by well a lot of different stuff and i never settled on any style so i did a book called eek which got published in america i published it here and here i am looking around for it and that was and that was uh deliberately done in different art styles so I would, I would, I did the whole thing. I had a few writers helping me out with some of the short stories, but it was based on the House of Mystery or EC short horror tales with a twist ending. And I used to enjoy as a kid black and white. One thing I loved was on the newsstands you get the House of Mystery or the DC, you know, the Murray comics reprints that were out in the 80s. Oh, Murray so, yeah. and uh, there's a couple of Aussie publishers that repackaged American comics in black and white. They chucked the colour plates away and they'd print Batman and Superman and Jimmy Olsen all in the one album. It was called Murray Comics. It was printed in Lidcombe in Sydney, I believe. I didn't know where that was at the time. I lived in Brisbane as a kid, but mm -hmm. uh, I always sort of wondered how that all happened. Um, and they were the only comics I could get at, the, at my local newsagent in, in uh, America Vat in Brisbane. You would so not buying Phantom comics at the time, Jason. Uh, the the only Phantom stuff I knew about was um, you just couldn't get comics in the suburbs until I discovered uh, Ace uh, comics in Ian yep. Gould comic shops in Brisbane. I'd go in there as a kid and take my drawings in and bug the crap out of him. Hi, Ian. Um, <laughs> I'd never seen American colour comics because you just couldn't get them in newsagents. You could only get the Commando, the British Commando little yep. comics. Uh, got some mad magazines. I don't know how. I knew about that. And I just knew about DC mainly because most of the Murray comics reprints um, were, were the DC stuff. Uh, and it was in black and white, so I never saw, I never saw colour comics. But I, I did like... Um, I did like the Sunday funnies in the Sun Herald uh, and it did have Cy Barry Phantoms and I always loved his, art, his artwork. I didn't really follow the stories. I couldn't really because it was hard on the Sunday pages to follow much at all because you only got like, you know, a, a couple of tiers of story. Yeah. And then there mm -hmm. was the dailies in the papers. So I was pretty... Um, ignorant about comics for most of my life really until until i started earning money and i could buy, could buy my own comics from the comic shops in sydney so i'd haunt all the shops in sydney because i lived in sydney for years in inner city sydney get on the bus go to phantom zone do the circuit land beyond beyond phantom zone king's comics around the latin quarter there walk around and buy black and white comics i always just love black and white comics mainly and yeah. And so was this in the 80s or the 90s? 90s. 90s. Late 90s, yeah. Mid to late 90s, yeah. So you talked before about how you um, uh, how you first met Glenn, Glenn Ford um, when he was buying a back page for advertising. Was that for his Phantom Zone shop? Phantom Zone would always take the back page when King's Comics didn't. King's yep. Comics usually had it and Phantom Zone would take the inside back or the back page, which which – really helped me out because I was losing money hand over fist self-publishing. Um, and so, they, yeah, they were really supportive. I'm very appreciative of that. No worries. Now, um, I, I guess also you also did a um, – I should have been more prepared. You should have, uh, You did a Phantom card um, in the first yeah. gallery series, Electric which card, was yeah. – Yeah, in the 1996 or something. Is that – Yeah. Yeah. So was yeah. that your first – I guess, published Phantom bit of work? Yeah, that's the first time Glenn Ford hired me to draw the Phantom. Yeah. Mm. And the last time for a long time. 
because he, well, he wasn't he wasn't the boss then. You know, he was an yeah. artist. Yeah, he and, was people trying to get his own stuff published by yeah, Freeland. I didn't actually know he was an artist. I just thought he ran a comic shop. I didn't know he had a commercial art career, and only recently I've seen some of his you know phantom stuff, which is really terrific. And um, I just knew him as a comic shop as as you know one of the more supportive comic shop owners. So he'd not only take a back page ad but he'd um he'd buy some comics to sell in his shop so he'd buy 20 or 30 comics and that was that was just a way of me recouping some of my costs you know which weren't that great but still a few grand for me back then was a lot of money you yeah. blow a few grand on a comic uh, on publishing a comic easy yeah yeah yeah, like, yeah uh, that's a that's a, a bold thing for you to do if i might say jason like for, for thing, you to yeah. It's a very <laughs> stupid thing to do. <laughs> Let's be honest. Who knows what my girlfriend thought? I should have spent it on a car. I didn't, I didn't learn to drive till I was 38. I just can we try and, yeah, can we try and ask if that girlfriend became on. the wife or did the uh, spending no. money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it all ended horribly. Um, you know, I must have been a very weird young man. That's all I can say. <laughs> Borderline oh. autistic, as it did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, so just for those there, I'll, um, if you're on YouTube, I'll drop a better picture there, but I'm just holding up um, one of the cards there. This is also one of the promo cards as well um, for the series as well. Yeah, Glenn coloured that, I think. Oh, okay, wow. Well. Coloured it. Yes, he did. It says yeah. it right at the bottom in the small, small print. Oh, and I know this is going to be jumping around, but uh, just to follow the line of questioning, I guess. Um, but it, it, it we it probably didn't come out of the blue for you then that when Glenn had the opportunity to hire you as a cover artist and as a story artist that he came calling. Like you've had that relationship from you know twenty twenty five years ago. Yeah, it didn't hurt. I heard about that he he bought you know, they him and Dudley and Rene had bought through, and I immediately sent him a cover drawing. Right. That's like, oh wow, how cool, you know, check this out, you know. And that ended up on the cover of um uh 1892 or something like that. The Pit Is that the oh that's the um Pint in Blood story. Yeah. So I read... unrelated, unrelated to that story at all. So he had that in his drawer for ages. He said, Oh yeah, I'll print that, and then months went past. He gave me other work to do, and I just thought it would never see print. And then he plonked it on the cover of the Inked in Blood story. Oh, is that the one where he's kind of like half in the trench coat, like yeah. bursting out of it? So oh, this oh. one here. Um, yeah. Again, if you're on um, if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see. This is probably yeah. um, this is probably my favorite, my, my most favorite of your covers. Yeah. I just yeah, I really like it's like the, the atmosphere and uh, and then and everything. It's it's really cool. I really enjoyed that one. And I like the image of him bursting out of the, of the Mr. Excellent. Walker garb. There's a mm. um, a story from uh, was it Moonstone, the um, the KGB no Noir, I think. That yeah. Was, yeah. And there's a scene or a panel where he's doing kind of like the same thing. He's in a car and he's tran well, transforming is the wrong word, but um, yeah, bursting out of the Mr. Walker trench coat into the Phantom, and it just looked awesome. Like, um, and yeah, just it's reminiscent of that, and I, I really like that that image. Yeah. Well, that's me doing a spirit riff. So the spirit was an American character from the 40s by Will Eisner. Yep. And um, the spirit was always getting into fights with his fists. He wasn't super powered. And you'd always see him getting really beaten up and all his gear would get ripped and he'd always get really smashed in the stories. And I really liked that. You know, he'd always pick himself up despite the fact that he had crap beaten out of him. And, and even with the rain... The rain dripping and all that, that's a that's a tribute to Will Eisner. So mm -hmm. anyone who knows that riff will, will get will get that, you know. So um that that was me bringing comic book book influences into the Phantom, which I'm still doing. And a couple of fans have pointed out uh, have noticed things that um where I've deliberately referenced a, a favorite American artist or a fa favorite sort of shtick. Like, for example, a guy pointed out um, I'd, done a, I'd done a balloon with blood dripping to form the panel of the balloon. So a guy's getting stabbed. I think it was in the first gaslight. The guy gets the knife in him 
and the blood's dripping down, like the panel board is turning into blood, you know? Yeah, right. He goes, oh, I love that. It's like he'd never seen it before. And I'm like, oh, well, you'd like Will Eisen. I did what? Who's that? You know, so. The the style of that of that uh, inked in blood is that kind of it feels a bit like Will Will Eisner as well. Is that a fair comment or? Yeah, uh, well, that's a compliment it, it, uh, if you think that. Um, but I can't hold a candle to him. <laughs> so, Jason, could you um, just tell us how you for those again for those who came in late and haven't listened to uh, episode sixty five. Could you just tell us a bit about uh, about Gaslight and how you got that role? Was it uh, did Glenn Ford seek you out or? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Sequira took the concept to Glenn, and um, my name came up probably because of Eek, Eek which is a self published horror anthology which just has me in it. That's me doing the different art styles, you know, all black and white, dark and moody. So Glenn Ford has made the connection of, oh, Jason does moody streetscapes and misty kind of black and white stuff. And um, I'm pretty sure that that got me the gig there. I, I don't know if anyone else had turned it down or was in contention for it. But like I said, we already had uh, a, a you know good re- and still do have a, a friendly relationship, so um, that might might have smoothed the way. I don't know. Mm. I, in in talking to Glenn, he has said that you're you're one of the fastest artists he's ever worked with, and one of the more one of the most reliable ones as well. Um, that you get everything in ahead of time as well. And uh, in talking to a few publishers, they always say that those type of uh, creators are worth their weight in gold. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, a lot of, is it a point with you, Jason, to, to get things done as quickly as you possibly can? Have you always been uh, fast on the pen? or No, I just have an obsessive personality. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited about something and I just can't. I find it hard, hard to stop. And I'm trying. I'm trying to um, slow down because <clears throat> I'm a bit wary of being. This happened to me in storyboards. I was a bit wary of being known as um, a human photocopier because uh, um, there's a, there's an idea that if you're churning it out, it's not as good or or that it can be sloppy. And so I'm trying to tread a, a fine line between having. Your stuff look, my stuff look energetic, but not sloppy. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that that's my struggle. I try and slow down and and have a rest because I do get a sore, I get a, a bad neck and a sore back. So I would literally get whiplash if I draw for. I can't draw like I can't work like I used to, you know, mm-hmm. um, because my neck just literally, I just lose mobility in my neck and I become like, oh. Oh my god! I worked too hard this week. I do a storyboard job, and I'd have to go to an office and draw for ten hours straight. And they would pile scripts on me because they could see I was just churning out. Because I had the same reputation as a storyboard artist, so I could churn out a reasonable looking frame in like five minutes. And so they just chuck script after script, and you're getting paid by the hour, not by the frame, which is terrible. So it worked yeah. against me. Like in storyboards, that actually worked against me because. If you're getting paid by the hour, then um, you go home and you get up the next day and you, you're like, you can't move your can't move your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had to kind of really sort of cool it and and sort of take my time. So <clears throat> these days, I try and sort of um, I try and labour over things. I try and be a bit more like Glenn Lumsden. I think I think ideally we'd like to sort of mix each other in the same body because. He's always complaining about how slow he is. He complains about himself being slow. And um, I think he'd like to churn stuff out more, but he just can't let a panel go without it being like a cover, like every panel's a cover. Yeah. I can't can't do that. I don't understand how that can work for artists because I just go mad because I want to see the story take shape. My favourite part, I think, is... 
is laying out the story and then sort of fleshing it out real quick with markers and getting like a rough inked version and getting the energy of it and looking at the flow of the energy and, and checking the and checking that storytelling is tight, you can understand what's going on, and that all the major panels are big, and you've got a good balance of, of the action as opposed to the boring bits. Um, and then it gets more tedious for me once it gets into the detailing and polishing and all that. That's when I start to struggle because, to me, the fun bit's finished and, and then it's just window dressing to me then, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I like I like I like working fast because it's exciting. But I know that fans do like detail. They do like nice noodling on the features, and that's all part of the experience here. That you can really look at. I love it too. You know, you you're looking at the page and you're really pouring over the work. You know, you're really looking at every line and just you know enjoying it over and over again. You know, you look at Glenn Lumps and stuff over and over again. You can pick it up. Go back to it, keep picking it up, picking it up. Oh, that's so great. He's just really nailed that face or something like that. You know? So when we had Glenn Lumsden on, he did talk about uh, his slowness yeah, as well. <laughs> He's great. He's classic. He's so funny. Yeah, yeah he was. So, Steve. That's all right. Um, so when you're um, planning out a, 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 a frame or, or a page or, or your story, um, now you mentioned earlier that you your experience with comics were black and white. When, when you're planning it out, are you thinking how it looks in black and white or are you thinking how this would look in, in colour? No, no, I'm, I'm thinking how it looks in black and white because I know that if it looks good in black and white, it will look good in colour. However, I could leave all the black out and leave heaps of spaces and with the right colouring, it would still look good. But I don't like, but it's not always going to be in colour. That's mm. the thing. Mm. There's always going to be a black and white version somewhere. Someone's always going to see it in black and white. And if it disappears, then to me, that's a failure. You know, to me, you should see it from across the room. You should be able to see it from across the room. If I'm standing at the back of the room and it's disappeared, there's no black, then to me, that's, a, that's, that's, not, that's not what is comics to me. Mm. You know, but having said that, you look at Mebius' stuff, you know, Jean Giraud stuff, from Metal Hurlant and Blueberry. Actually, Blueberry's early stuff is more traditional. So I like the more traditional comics where you're spotting the blacks. They call it spotting the blacks. So you're putting large chunks of black in. So when you walk away from it, you, it looks like a checkerboard. So there's a sense of depth. There's an inbuilt sense of depth. Okay. And you don't rely on the colour. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with that, but even in a coloured page, if you don't have some juicy thick blacks giving it depth, then it's still not going to have that same three-dimensionality. It, it can wash out, can't it? It can look washed out. It can look, it can look two-dimensional. Yeah. Mm. And that can affect the storytelling. Like sometimes you've got to see something's right up front in the, in the front. It, it, and one thing you learn... With, with black and white art is black comes forward. So when you're using black on the page, it has a, it goes like that, right? Yeah. So you balance that. You use that trick of black comes forward. Yeah. I we've, when, whenever we've talked to some artists, they've always said that when they've, whether they're Team Phantom Man artists or the newspaper artists, they, they, it wasn't until they saw a free comic that they, you know, some have actually made mention that they've had to change their style to suit the free comic, which is traditionally in black and white, and eighty percent of its stories are in black and white. Where, you know, newspaper and Team Phantom Men are in color. So, yeah, good for them. Yeah, I did the yeah. same thing with Mad. I did the first hair, but it went in Mad, and I saw it, and I just felt sick. I just said, "Oh my god, it doesn't doesn't look right at all." Mm. Like here's my mini comic style getting plonked into a mad comic and mad comic should be all about mad, crazy detail and all the eye pops and the chicken fat. They used to call it chicken fat, all the, all the little tiny sight gags and the little tiny bits of detail around, around the edge, you know, edges of the panels. And I thought, oh, no, I'm going to have to 
step up my game here. I'm going to have to go much more. And you see it in the, in, in the book that Dan's got. You can see the, the first stuff's really kind of clean and very smooth, lots of creative white space. And then by the end of it, I've, there's no white space left in the panel at all. <laughs> I'm just cross patching the shit out of everything. Oh, literally, literally. Right. So that's that's the very first page. That's the first um, one, yeah. And then just, just any random page towards the back. Um, and yeah. you're absolutely right. There's uh, much more detail, much more mm. filling of space with the with the black uh, than than we saw in the in the early stories. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it looks it looked more looked more correct to me. I, I always thought it should always look really cluttered in Mad Magazine. You know? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Whereas Phantom's yeah. different. Phantom, you know, Phantom Comics is always that sophisticated, smooth black and white balance you know uh whether whether it, not just sci sci stuff of course but you know all the other stuff the adventure stuff tends to demand a little bit more i don't know cl clean sort of more of a clean sort of look mm. contrast mm. contrasty mm. Yeah, sort of noir i suppose mm. yeah at the moment in the light in the latest in the current latest couple of comics that we're getting, we're seeing the Grey Malican, which is the second part of Gaslight. Um, I think we're into part four is being released. Um, so how many parts? 1902 is, is part four, yeah. Yeah, 1902. So how many parts um, in this current story, Jason? Eight. Eight. So we're halfway through. So it's a full page story. Eight times eight, yeah. That's... um. That's yeah. the latest. That's episode four's in there, and you've also done the cover as well. Yeah, that's the Malkin stuff in the back, and there's a terrific Joan. I don't know how to say his name. Joan Box. Boyks. Boyks. Box. Yeah. How do you say? Joan? Is that it? We'll have to get him on the podcast and tell us. <laughs> He's unreal. I love him, and he. The Pit A. Anderson's written it's a Dracula story. It's yes, great. So honoured to be doing the cover. And I'm so sorry, Joe. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm on the You should be doing the whole thing, you know. <laughs> I shouldn't even be in it. His work and your work kind of fits together. I've noticed that you've done a lot of his covers. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if that's intentional, but, yeah, like I said, I'm not I'm not worthy, but I'm grateful. <laughs> his horror stuff in the, in the 70s and 80s, um, sorry if I've got the era wrong. Is 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 pinnacle? It's peak. It's amazing. It's like the Warren stuff, you know. I don't know if he ever worked for Warren, but they're like the ultimate black and white horror publisher ever. You know, all the Spanish guys. You know, the Spanish mm. artists are the best. You know, they're just yeah. masters. Yeah, I've always thought that Jones work also looks better in black and white than color as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't need color at all. Same as the Filipino artists, you know. The Filipinos in the Spanish. It's just like they're just masters of the form. You can't beat them. I mean, there's also the Belgians and that too, and Europeans in general. Amazing artists. It's all that history, you know. Need to go out and see him and source myself a few more comics there from around the world. <laughs> Check out these other artists. Tell me about it. So do you have, a, of the stories that you've created so far, whether it's um, uh, for Fru, for Fru, the Gaslight or the standalone stories, do you have a favourite one? Um, which one stands Funny out say most that. to you? Funny you say that. Sorry, I've got to do this. Um, <clears throat> where is it? Unpublished Phantom. Here we go. Unpublished. You've probably heard about this folder. Have you heard I've, about this folder? I've okay. heard you've got you several folders. Okay, so this is yeah, an just unpublished my screen. Event. Look at it all. Unpublished. Look, look at it. <laughs> so what we've got is what we've got is that's uh Crusader pencils. That's all been printed. Fair enough. Yes, thank you. Printed, printed, printed. The hybrid horror. 22 page gaslight feature featuring Dr. Moreau in color oh. and black. Not printed, 22 pages. And then we've got um then we've got coming up next in the unpublished Jason Paulus file is 
Oh, War Wounds, that's been printed. Fair enough. Poor People's Plague's been printed. Um, oh, here we go. Here's an oddity entitled Hijack. Phantom in Hijack. Not a gaslight story. 22 pages written by me. Not published. Um, so that's two 22 pages. And these were done a couple of years ago. I can get myself in trouble here. And here's another one. 22 pages. The African Princess. Feature written by me. Featuring um, Dorian um, Dorian Gray. Okay. Oh. That's like, 22 pages unpublished. Okay. That's two years old. So I was very busy two years ago producing all this <laughs> stuff and none of it's come out. So, so uh, that's three stories so far. The Anatomist. So we're up to four 22-page stories in colour and black and white. Phantom meets Frankenstein. But I couldn't call him Frankenstein, so it had to be the reanimator. So I had to change it. So the problem is some of the stories that I've done uh, are in danger of being written or done by someone else if they suddenly decide to print that version of that particular character. So that's four to 22-page stories. That's The Anatomist. And it's all primo artwork. It's all, like, the best I could do. Um, and then we've got a couple of... Uh, part ones that never saw a part two. There's a werewolf one written by Andrew Constant. That's like a two eight-page ones and a um, some kind of weird fish lady on the docks in Gaslight. See, she's got fins and claws. So, yeah, it's a bit of stuff there. I'd love to see published one day. So is so, Phil sitting on that at the moment? Yeah, it's all yeah. been paid for. They're just sitting on it. So what, what they've just done recently is they've said, all right, so Dudley wants some more eight-page backup stories. So I'm assuming that they must have had a couple of letters saying, oh, oh we like Jace's artwork, whatever, so how can we get Jace's stuff in print but not give him the lead story, okay, because he's done so many lead stories. We could print Jason Paulos stories for like a couple of months and not run out, but we can't do that because people are complaining. <laughs> so I'm now in the process of dividing those stories or one of them, I'm hoping they'll do more, into eight-page segments that will then run in the back. So Yeah. Really. yeah. yeah. Well, Mine it's up. good to see as, as you flicked through that big folder of unpublished stories, a couple of them have now been published. So, you know, yeah, you're yeah, obviously yeah. on the conveyor belt there somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just recently, the timing might be curious, I don't know, but. Just, re just recently, uh, I did put a post on Facebook saying, hey, just want to let you guys know I've actually done a lot more than what like everyone says I'm so fast, but they haven't printed that many stories. <laughs> so where's the, you know, it's like making me look stupid. So, you know, I am really fast and I'm really proud of the stuff. I didn't just fucking sh It's not shit, right? It's stuff I can still look at and be proud of it and some of it I've even written because I, mm -hmm. I can draw faster than people can write apparently. Yes. So um, <laughs> we've heard that as well. <laughs> so um, was, um, I, I had, I had yeah. a bit of a whinge on Facebook and I shared some stuff. So I don't know. And then suddenly the Malkin came out. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I also <laughs> saw that you got your poster as well. I got my poster, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not Glenn's fault. He's, <laughs> every time I go to a convention, he goes, oh, yeah, I should get you. Take one of these, take one of those. Um. And, yeah, I'm, he's just a busy guy. Yes. He's a busy guy. Yeah. Now, in in their defence, Glenn has t uh, – he made mention, I think it was on this podcast or at one of the conventions, that he's got, like – he's got, like – he could do, like, three or four years of just stories that have already been purchased and in the middle of being created and all that. Yeah. So it's it's good to see – yeah, yeah, it's it's good to see and hear. Well, it's great to see that artwork, um, but it's good to hear that you know there's a lot a lot more phantom stories to be created. Well, I, well, I also have been created. They just haven't been yeah, published. Been published. That's oh, great yes. to hear that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I made a, a rod for um, Glenn's back probably early on because some of the scripts I got um, I sent back because there were too many panels on the page. Yeah. Right, so it followed it followed the European model of a nine-panel grid, right? And it's something that that 
you know, European artists like Jones still follow. And Pide loves writing nine panel grids. But I just said, look, there's too, there's too much, there's too many panels. I can't, like, you've got to have, and this, this is probably why he's paired me with Andrew Concert because Andrew writes stuff American style, which is a six panel grid, right? Yeah. So the American six panel grid is sort of seen as sort of the standard from the American point of view, but the Europeans go, ah, that's not enough. We must put more panels in. That's a total waste of space. And so they just chuck, you know, two pages worth of story in one page and the poor bloody, poor Joan has to do like fucking 10 <laughs> panels and in the middle the phantom's coming across the castle and then climbing up the wall and you want to make that a big panel. You want, mm. you want the reveals mm. to be big. And yep. Joan's really good at it. Like he does. He, doesn't waste an inch on the page but I, I just I just had to say look there's no there's no sense of pacing there's no sense of drama I don't know why it ended up that most European fandom stuff followed a nine panel grid and some of them go up to 12 panels maybe not 12 but 10 mm. and visually to me it's it's just really hard to read my brain just just can't can't I have to really struggle to read the European stories. I really have to work to get through them. Not because the art's no good, not because it's a bad story. It's just because the pacing is just so fast. Right? So the more no so slow. Sorry. So the more panels you put on a page, the slower it is to read. Mm. Which and for me, my brain just loves seeing stuff pop out and I love seeing the big dramatic bits and you know it's everything. Everything's a balance, but you know, I, I, I don't know. Paul Glenn, like he's, you know, he's then had to go. Oh shit! Who's going to draw this fucking story? It's got you know, ten <laughs> panels in every page. Paul doesn't want to do it, you know. So I probably then, you know, cause problems then. But um, I just couldn't see myself doing a good job with so yeah. many panels on the part. I just couldn't see myself making myself or anyone or the writer looking good. Mm. And I, I guess that's yeah. probably a, a sign of maturity as well that you want you want the story to be at its best, and if you can't do that, there, there might be someone who can do that. Well, I'm not saying that, but it, it just seemed to be there's an American style of comic reader, and there's a European style of comic reader, and the Europeans just love it when all the panels are on the side. Hmm. They just love all their landscape panels all teared up, like what we're looking at now. Yep, full <laughs> landscape. The landscape. So yeah. to me, that's just visually just so static. My brain just can't handle it. So being a fan of Will Eisner, who incidentally, weirdly, did put too many panels on his pages as well, but he, he was drawing for big Sunday pages, big newspaper pages. It wasn't ever in comics. Uh, but he, he had the concept of the page being a maxi panel. So one idea per page, and you have all these incidents that happen within that idea, but you're trying to be sympathetic to the reader's eye and you're trying to you're trying to guide the reader through the page right guide the reader's eye you're not just going bang 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 you like you, having two locations on on a page for example where's the sense of timing so the phantom arrives here oh okay so he's at a beach now oh shit now three panels later fuck he's just flown to you know, a castle now. Where are we now? So you've got to have a panel with the plane and landing and he's in a car. So, and you got all that on one page and part of my brain just goes, oh, this, uh, this is just too boring. I can't, I can't, mm. can't in, I can't, I'm not enjoying reading this story. To me, the story, you should be able to firstly read it without words. You should firstly be able to follow what's happening without the words. And then when the words go in, you can't have too many words. If you have more than fucking, I mean, people have worked it out. Better people than me have worked it out. If you have more than so many words in each panel, you're going to lose your reader. Bye-bye, reader. They're off doing something else. They don't even know why they've stopped reading your story. They've mm. just gone, oh, fucking, I'll go and watch mm. YouTube because it, it's easier. It's interesting because a lot of the times, and, and we've spoken on the podcast before about, you know, European stories in particular being oh, and we, we often talk about it with terms of the dialogue and the, and the amount of words yeah, yeah. on the page, but it's interesting hearing the way that you've, you see it with all of the artwork on the page as well. 
Um, and that and that's making some sense to me as you say that because it um, it does it, it, it uh, slows that story down, which makes it more cumbersome to read. And um, and that's the sort of criticism that uh, that people would often have with some of the European stories. Uh, there's some fantastic stories well, out there as well, but yeah, it, it, that slowing of the pace um, makes sense. What you're saying, yeah. yeah so the the beats of the story they call the story beats. So your beats that happen on your page are, okay, the action, bang, that's a beat. Uh, Phantom, um, you know, uh, um, you know, jumps out in front of the bad guy from behind a door. That yeah. So you, you hit your beats, and and you've got to kind of pace it out. You know, you you've got to like pacing is super important. And some writers will just they'll just chuck too much stuff and slow the pacing right down. You know, the other side of the coin is you don't have enough panels and so it's it's too quick and so you've you bought your comic, you're all excited and you haven't even finished your cup of coffee, you finished reading the comic. So yeah. that's not good either. So you've got to have your boring exposition and you've got to have the, the, the fandom getting on the plane and whatever. But um, you don't want to be, you don't want to be mushing that all together with the action pages either. So yeah. I had a Pinay yeah. Anderson script which I sent back to Glenn and said, mate, there's too much dialogue on each panel. There's too many panels. Can we split it in half and do a two-parter? And that was inked in blood, right? Yep. And that was, that was really silly because what we ended up with was a two-part story where nothing happened. Phantom walked around. Good story. I'm not knocking it. But nothing happened in the whole story. Phantom was like a detective and he only rides a motorbike at the very end. And I thought, oh, God. So I've kind of fucked his story up in a way by, by, by giving myself lots of space to draw, but all I'm drawing is the phantom walking around page after page. Mm. It was a great story, but nothing, there was no action in it. So, uh, you know. Can't win them all. No. I, and Glenn, bless him, he goes, oh, okay, all right, I'll you know, send it back here. <laughs> So I was just wondering how descriptive the, the writers are do, and how much freedom they give you on, on the page. It kind of alluded to it, I guess, then. And we showed a, a little bit of a, a, an image up on the screen before everything went a bit nuts. Um, now, basically, it was just a fan walking down the street. But would the writer just say, this is what I want, the fan walking down the street? Or would they say, I want this happening, this happening, this happening, as, a for, as he's walking down the street? Just, yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as a rule, I'd expect... And, and I get writers saying <clears throat> it's this many panels um, and this is what happens and this is what gets said. That's what's expected. That's what they're expected to hand into Glenn. However, if I have a relationship with a writer and they say we want to do this Marvel style, which is different, which is I'll just give you a couple of paragraphs, outline of what I want, and then you plot the action, you decide how many close-ups you're going to have, you decide which panel is going to be big, and I'll I'll allow you enough room to do that. So um, that that's I, I don't mind wor working either way is fine, but you know Glenn being Glenn, he's super accommodating. He he gives you the run. He doesn't hassle me about what I draw or how I draw it. So I always go into a phantom story with a feeling of excitement where I'm not going to have to fit a house style because I don't draw the I don't draw the classic phantom. I can't draw a classic phantom. Mm. You know, so I I always like guys like Pat Boyette who did a weird shriveled kind of horror Dracula looking phantom guy with a hook nose. <laughs> that just appeals to me because to me he's like a horror character mm. and I never have him smiling. Um and Glenn doesn't mind. So I love him for that. So he allows some artistic license. But as far as the, the, the pacing goes, I, I think it's either done right or wrong. So a good writer will, will, be, will uh, I don't say bow, but will defer to the artist's ability to, to know what's going to work in terms of the page and what doesn't because there's different ways of telling the story. There's not one, one necessarily a better way, but there's definitely a wrong way to do it where you, you turn in a very boring static page of artwork that's boring as shit. 
So one, one thing I noticed Joan Box doing is he, he varies the angles of the panel borders. He does everything he can to get around that boredom factor of all those bloody panels. And I wish they'd give him a fucking break and let Joan do a six-panel page, for God's sake. So oh. um, here's just an example in the latest story. One, where two, you've got- three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. And then you've See got that, the different, you've got the different that's a day angles. Off for Joan doing, doing a seven panel page, that's a holiday for him. <laughs> and even he can see, yeah, he, he, he has funny. mixed up the 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 borders and the panel shapes yeah. Yeah. Um, to try and, you know, to keep, to break it up, as you say, and keep it a bit more interesting. And also to fit as much as he can in. Because one yeah. of the things I've found is if you, if you rough sketch out a page, it doesn't always fall into neat boxes. So you can get around that by angling it. And it also gets around that static thing where you, you see the collections of Phantom Dailies and, you, and they put them into a comic book page and, boy, you try getting through a bunch of those when there's no break from that relentless landscape, landscape, you know. Mm. So, yeah, um, Mike, yeah, Mike talks about trying, yeah. to, trying to add dynamics to it or yeah, make it more dynamic. He, he knows he's restricted to the, yeah. to the panel. Or yeah. the three panels, but yeah, he tries to mix up as as much as possible. Yeah, you put little, you put insets in, or you put you know slanted. But but really, if the writer just doesn't overload it with too many words, then then you, you know you you've got a fighting chance of keeping the reader's attention. Your, your job is to to keep people in front of the story. Mm. You know, I give my stuff to people, or my girlfriend, or my missus, or whatever, and. If they put it down and hand it back to you, I go, oh, that's good. It's kind of like, well, not necessarily much. She's not a comic person. But if you give it to a comic person or someone who's interested in art and they hand it straight back to you, you want them, you want them to look at and, and start reading it when they don't even mean to. Yeah. So the drawings yeah. make it so easy that you're already flicking through it. and You, you know what I mean? So it's an, it should feel natural to read a comic. It shouldn't be work. Yeah. That's what the yeah. pictures are for. Especially what you were saying before um, about, you know, they'll just wander off and watch YouTube or what in, in 2021, in this era, it's so easy. There's so much other entertainment that yeah. the, the comic book to, to maintain relevance has to be able to do that. Yeah, and I don't know if you've done it, but if you try and read a comic, you don't even know that you're trying to read it for a start. And then you've, you've read it and you don't even realise you didn't really understand it. But then sometimes you go, oh, I'll just go back. What's going on there? And you'll just go back again. And it's so hard to work out what went wrong, but it's not your fault as the reader. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's never the reader's fault that they couldn't get through the story. It should be so easy for the reader to do it that it should they shouldn't even know that they've actually had to put some effort in. It should be effortless. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. There's all these little tricks where you're trying to seduce the reader's eye and you're trying to just cushion their reading experience into a nice, nice, exciting ending, if you can. Yeah. yeah. So, Dan, as, a, as an English teacher, how, how, do, how, how does that feel like? How does that sound like? Is- oh, no, 100%. Um, it, that, you, you're exactly right there. You've got to, uh, you've got to have little hooks and, and um, mini cliffhangers and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and I like what uh, Jason's saying there about one idea per page and working through that way. Uh, so whether it's through the, the dialogue, if you want to talk about the writing in that sense, or the artwork, you've got to have those little moments that keep keep the reader wanting to go to the next scene. Yeah, and, there, and there's sometimes debates about caption boxes and things like suddenly, dot, 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 or later that night, and some writers go, ah, God, no, I'm not going to do any of that shit. You know, it's just too, it's just too old-fashioned and boring. But honestly, if you're not going to, if you're not going to stick to the tropes of traditional comics, you're just going to lose people. Like mm. people aren't going to care that you've got this new concept for comics and you've suddenly thrown away all the tropes that they've come to know and love, like caption boxes, narration boxes, flashback balloons with the curled edges, all the fashion stuff. You can't just chuck that all away and expect the reader to go with you on your crazy adventure reinventing the language of comics because they're just going to not going to care they just want to read a story that makes sense yeah well you're looking at decades of of 
of ideas that have worked or tropes, as, as you put it. Yeah. Yeah, like better people have tried. Like, you know, if, believe me, it would have been done by now if, if there was a better way of doing a more readable comic. It would have happened, and we, we'd all be talking about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always find comics is it's my, um, it's your rest. Like, you've got to do reading for work and you've got to do all this, you know, professional reading, and then you've got your novels and stuff that you read. Comics is escapism for me. You just want to breathe it, and it's just, like you said, flowing, and, yeah, it, it shouldn't take, it shouldn't be a hassle. Yeah. No, not for the reader. It should be a hassle for the writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for you guys. <laughs> yeah, you put you put. Absolute nightmare. Uh, <laughs> at first, we enjoy the fruits. It's our escape. <laughs> it's our escapism. That's it. Yeah, well, uh, mm. you know, it's it's disappointing to to think that you know you're working so hard on something and people just aren't reading, just aren't getting it. Or you know, I said to I said to Jeremy, I oh, hey, do you, do you like the stuff that I'm doing? And he goes, Yeah, yeah. I go, Well. What, what do you think of the story? He goes, oh, yeah, it's fine. I go, well, what's happening in the story, Jeremy? Tell me what's happening. And he's like, oh, I don't know, but I just love your artwork. <laughs> like, oh. So so he, what, so the point was I could see that the Phantom's walking from one end of the room to the other and punching the guy out the window and then getting on a plane, but I don't fucking know why, but it looks great. Like I get what's <laughs> happening, but I just don't. You know what I mean? So uh, I can only make it clear. I can not I can only make what the writer wants as clear as I can. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a dud story or a concept that the reader hates, then that, that's, uh, that's beyond um, my, uh, that's not my pay scale. <laughs> so, I'm writing it and then I'm in big trouble. You know? <laughs> then I've, I've got no one to blame then. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, Jason, you, you mentioned Glenn Lubston earlier and you're working together with him as a, as a team. He's yeah. writing and you're drawing the uh, Grey Malkin series. Um, as Germ said earlier, we're, we're up to four out of eight issues there uh, or episodes there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, I guess, Grey Malkin? Are you enjoying that? I think part of, at the end of uh, we're halfway, we're about to shift from the jungle into into the city. I'm looking forward to that. Um, the experience of working with Glenn Lumsden, it sounds like you guys have known each other for a long time. Yeah, he's my mentor. Yeah, he's the reason I do comics because uh, years ago when I bought Dark Nebula uh, as a kid, I wrote a fan letter in. I was 10. And, and Tad, the publisher and the writer, sent me a page of Glenn Lump, this guy, Glenn Lumsden, here's how he does layouts. This is what you do. And I didn't know that you're supposed to do a, a, like a rough scribble version of the page and then you've got to trace over it or draw it again neater and then ink it. I didn't know there were stages to it. And I, this blew me away. So, oh, wow, he looks like he's drawing really fast and he doesn't care and it's a mess, but it's still really cool. You know, you could see... You could see his conceptual sketches and he hasn't bothered tidying it up. So it was a bit of a peek behind the curtain of how you draw a comic. I learned so much from that one little photocopy. And then uh, when I eventually moved to Sydney, I tracked down all the local comic artists and I met Glenn and, um, and got to know him better. And uh, even when he moved to Adelaide, I, I went to visit and I spent some time in his studio drawing and, I just learned heaps from him, not only about drawing, but not only about drawing comics, but telling a story because Glenn Ellis used to write plays and direct plays. Uh, and, and so it was all about um, what, what, what a good story is, what makes up a good story or how you can make a story better. And I still don't know, but um, I know that he knows. So I can answer you. <laughs> so is this the first time you've worked together as a as a team? With him writing only, yeah, yeah. It was my idea, so yeah. I suggested it to Glenn. Thought he liked the idea, and and of course, Glenn Lumsden loves. He he's a great writer, you know. He loves the art of writing, and he's he's not just into the uh, the the art of comics, but the whole experience of comics. Hence all the stuff about don't you don't want to lose the reader you know don't be don't sort of work really hard on something that it's just the reader just you've got to give them a chance you know you've got to you've got to hook them in and and smooth their way through to the end you know 
you made mention about you writing your stories as well. And when you showed us your folder of unpublished <laughs> stories, there was a few of those stories were written by you. Yeah. Um, so do you prefer drawing your own stories that you've written? Uh, yeah, I, I think it, that that's the, that's the ultimate. And I think Glenn's the same. I think that's the ultimate aim of, of a comic artist is also to, to, to write the stories. Um, I think it's, <clears throat> I think there's there's sort of an issue of control there, which I think, and and um, and sort of energy where you tend to I think go the extra yard when you're doing your own stories. So you sort of it's not that you're not trying when you're doing someone else's stories, but you, I think I feel a bit more inv emotionally invested in yeah. Uh, um, yeah. a story that I write as well. And I think when you see the results and you see the artwork. You, you might see an extra amount of effort put in just by the sheer fact of, well, I'm, I'm, I've got nowhere to hide with this. I can't share the blame with anyone. But the, the flip side of that is the horror of that feeling where you're just thinking, oh, I'm just not, I'm not hitting the mark here. There's something missing from this. And that, you know, that's, that's unavoidable. You know, it's much better to have someone that you can bounce ideas off and someone who can check what you're doing, someone who can read something and come back to you and go, look, this isn't really working. Why is this happening? Wouldn't it be better? But you just don't have that luxury, particularly with Glenn Ford, because he's, like I said, he'll give you all the creative freedom in the world within, you know, boundaries of King's Features and all that sort of stuff, which is a separate issue. But he's not going to baby. He's not going to hold your hand through your story writing. He's not going to fix your dumb plot point. He's going to pick you up on stuff like, okay, you can't have phantom killing an animal. You can't have phantom murdering somebody in cold blood. Like he'll pick all that stuff up, obviously, which you should know already, to be honest. <laughs> but he's not going to. He's not going to help you craft a better script. You're like that's up to you. So the buck ends with you. So if my stuff falls flat then oh, i've got no one else to blame but you know I've, I've tried to make the stories as entertaining as i can mm. so um out of all the stories you've created and the stories that have been published and have not been published is there one that stands out as your favorite yeah well i'd have to say um 1883 i think the the uh the plague story the poor people's plague story which was a which was um, a deliberate mirroring of the COVID thing yep. but said in Victorian times and with zombies instead of respiratory disease because I couldn't see much visual potential in rest. Actually, Glenn Ford suggested a zombie angle and they're not really zombies because they don't, you know, they're not, they're not really, un well, I guess they sort of are, but it wasn't a zombie law type thing. And I wrote the whole thing and I drew it and I coloured it and I did the backup story so and did the cover. So there's no more of an ego trip than that. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? So did you buy uh, extra copies of that one to send to mum and all the rest of it? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I'd have to say that one just for the sheer ego value of that one. <laughs> oh, that's um, you know, yeah, okay. I'd love um, to know what anyone else thinks because honestly, I, I haven't had much feedback on my writing. Um, but you know, I, I really would like to, you know, hear some some good feedback, e even if it's just that sucks or, or, that, <laughs> or that was, you know, it's fine. I can handle it. I can handle it. Well, there you go, listeners. Uh, make sure you jump onto our social media and also Jason's social media as well. We'll include yeah. that in the show notes. And yeah. make sure you let him know about what you thought of the Poor People's Plague, which Be is... Careful what you wish for, Jason. Yeah. Uh, if we're gonna uh, it that's evening. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's weird. My stuff is weird. I, gotta, I, gotta, I, I can't help but sympathise with traditional Phantom fans. I, I can understand why my stuff would horrify them. You know, but um, it is what it is, you know. Just for the record, The Poor People's Plague is the only one that you've written and um, been the other song that's been published, though, I think. so. Uh, yeah, 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 first full-length one, yeah. 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 Hopefully not the last, but like I said, uh, I, I just um, did, a, I just busted up a 22-pager into a, a three-parter to be used as a backup. 
And honestly, I think that's probably the best place for them because then they can be sort of hidden at the back of the book and people won't have it shoved in their face and they won't have to look at my skinny, crooked nose phantom too much and it'll get drip fed to them and hopefully it will be more palatable to well, them. Well, I, I think you're being a little bit unfair there um, to yourself, Jason, because yeah. to be honest, um, I got 1902 um, a couple of days ago yeah. and I went straight to the Grey Malkin and picked up no. to, to read part four. I actually yeah. haven't read the first, the, you know, the, the main part of the comic yet. I've only read the Malkin story. Oh, there you go. It's <laughs> working. So, it is. Well, I'm really enjoying that. <laughs> Excellent. So Glenn, Glenn's pacing is really good. Uh, the later episodes do get crazier. There's more stuff going on and there's baddies running around and fighting and shooting and it, it does tend to really ramp up. And to be honest, Glenn's a bit naughty. He's, he's got a lot going on in some of it. Um, but because he's lettering it means that he has to then pull it all together at the end He's got all the sound effects looking very sharp. He goes, he goes to the extra, he, he goes to the extra mile on the lettering. I, I love his lettering. His lettering so expressive. If you take the time to look at all the little nuances, he, he messes around with the font size and, and the font styles. And he really, he's a, such a student of classic comics that you just can't help but be sucked into. Mm. It because well, I agree with that. It's um it's the the narration boxes you were talking about before. The the way that he's just been doing the narration boxes through it. Um, yeah. it, it it is well, old the title. Time. The yeah. title. Yes. The title alone is a. I mean, the detail. It almost doesn't print. You know, it's <laughs> well, just so was that much. you that created that, or did um? Oh, no, I couldn't do that, man. That's just classic Glenn. That's just him loving typography and. That, that's just him <laughs> just geeking out on typography. Like, mm. you can do that, you know. It's remember, amazing he doesn't play music. He'd be a great musician. Mm. I remember doing typography at university. And yeah. it was, I, I remember when I started, it's just like, why on earth are we spending so much time just yeah. looking at text and all that? Yeah. And then when you really get into it and have a look at how it can play and the different sizes, the you know, the spaces between the letters and... Yeah. And, and all that type of stuff. It's it, I actually really enjoyed it by the end of the um of the of the semester. It was probably one of my more favourable um uh units that I did at, at, at university. Yeah, it's it's a legit art form, mm. and I like hand lettering as well. I, I like rough. I, I like lettering with personality. You know, mm. um, it, just anything but straight computery looking lettering. I, I think it's a real uh, it's a real f- a failure for amateur amateurs where um they just go for the the standard ellipse balloon and and uh and the standard crappy typeface comic sans or whatever at least use uh web letter or something that looks like actual <laughs> writing I've, I've noticed on this panel there's um on this page there's nine panels on the page um yeah, I have to have a word to clean about that. Yeah, as, <laughs> as we were talking, I saw that and I thought, oh, I'll have, to, I'll have, to, I'll have to raise that. <laughs> you've got three, you got three panels of a of a um of of a, I can't remember her name at the top of my head, but she's hanging out washing. Paris Green. <laughs> yeah, it's Harris. Indefatigable Paris Green. To, to be fair, though, like the, just <laughs> the, the balance there, because there's only four yeah. panels on the opposite side, um, and and sometimes. You know, the big you're talking about the beats or the pacing of a story, you do have to go yeah. through some exposition. And and I thought that that um, set up the payoff on in the last um, well, couple of panels. Not really all happening good. in the same place. So it's all happening yeah. in the same bit of jungle. So if you've got nine, if you've got a nine panel page, but three different global locations. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So you've somehow got to explain why we're now skipping in panel four to freaking London and then back to Bangala again. Forget it. Because then you've got to have a big caption box going. And next day after jumping on a plane, Phantom takes a taxi. <laughs> and so then you've got to allow for that. And by the time the artist gets to it, he's got a tiny little, you know, whereas that was uh, Paris picks up the Malkin and then it's almost like animation, looks around and he, he doesn't have lots of, words you know and that that's a real giveaway if you've got big choking big blocks of words choking the bottom of the page all getting lumped down the bottom you know it's like shaking up a snow globe you know 
and it all settles <laughs> on where all the good artwork's supposed to be. <laughs> and artists yeah. are like, it sounds like this podcast has been a real th- uh, th- therapeutic. Sorry? <laughs> I was just saying it sounds like this podcast has been a bit therapeutic for yourself as well. Yeah, sorry. It's always like this with me. <laughs> yeah. So how how long would it take you – so we talked before about your, your pace and your creator. How long would it take you to, like, draw and ink a, a page, like a, a normal, a normal oh. page? I'm a bit worried to say. Okay. <laughs> get false expectations. I'm a bit embarrassed Fair too, enough. to be honest. Yep. Honestly, I don't exactly get hard deadlines with the Phantom. So Glenn always goes, oh, okay, we've got a new script. Look, there's no deadline. Take your time. Oh, no worries. And I'll get him it next. I'll have it penciled in a week. And he must go, oh, Christ, can't this guy slow down, you know? So, I, I, like I said, I'm fast at the beginning and then I get slower towards the end, particularly with colouring, which I find a real chore, you know, because I'm, I'm ch- I feel like I'm chained to the screen, you know. So, now, I reckon you've told us once, haven't you, Jason, maybe this was at a, at a con when we were chatting, um, that you supply black and white and colour versions of every story that you send in to fruit? Yeah, yeah, that's part of the gig, yeah. That was requested, yeah. And yeah, okay. So... I took over the lettering too. It must yeah, be right. I, I did that on my own volition because, and for no extra money, as far as I remember, because um, because of the, um, what story was it? The Dale McCanty story. Oh, uh, Rise, of the, Rise of the Red yes. Dragon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where that magician guy. Yep. A flashback with the magician guy. Go and have a look at it. Go and have a look at it and try and read it and then um, have a look at some later stuff that I did and you'll notice, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because you've got to have the bloody captions in the right panel, don't you? You can't just have it in the wrong panel because that's <laughs> bad. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. <laughs> right, well, so I was well, like, uh, Glenn, tell you what, I'll do the lettering, okay? Is that all right? Yeah, sure, no worries. <laughs> Let's make sure it goes in the right Spot. <laughs> We've got listeners all over the uh, all over the country pausing the podcast to go and dig up their their copy of the uh, Rise. Oh. Uh, was it part one look, or part two? Uh, it's the flashback scene, the flashback into the market where the magician was a little boy in Marrakesh or something, and it, it's oh, okay. a, a classic flashback with the with the balloon, you know, the the, the cloud shaped balloons and the little head in with the caption at the top. And all I'm saying is, if you're going to letter a comic book, you need to know the difference between a caption box and a word balloon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyway. So do you get do you get frustrated then if you've coloured a... a anymore. A, <laughs> 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 back to the colours. Um, do you get frustrated if you've sent in a story that's been coloured and, and you've taken the time, you've just said that it's a bit tedious, um, and then it's published in black and white anyway? No, because I, I'm assuming that one day they might print it in colour, you know. Yeah, okay. It's just the one thing is you can't take a, a, a colour layer and just turn it to grey, expect it to print okay. Yeah. You know, the values are different, you know, so you can't have the greys all filling in too dark and stuff. So I will I will go and do a simpler grey layer and I'll literally just pick out the Phantom's outfit and maybe a tree in the background, just do one tone, just keep it super simple. So the printer doesn't fuck it up or or people don't get confused. And I always know that if Fru forgets to print the grey layer and it's just black and white, then it's totally fine because I got my blacks and they're all in uh, Yeah, right. And it doesn't disappear. Try you try and anticipate problems where you can. At the end of the day, through of pumping out, God, how many comics do they do? One comic every two weeks. Yeah. I mean, mad. And yeah, they've got all the fans inside and the merch. And there's, there, how many are there? There's only three or four of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah I don't know how they do it. It's amazing. It's amazing the bloody things don't come out looking like upside down or freaking. I mean, so many things can go wrong with printing. It's not funny. 
I've personally been responsible for terrible mistakes in corporate graphic design jobs where it's cost tens of thousands of dollars. The fuck up just cost like such a fortune, you know. Mm. And they didn't have time to send it back to the printer and print it again, you know, just mm. because my, my caption balloon was in the wrong place. Stop the presses, pull us. <sighs> Just bang, and there's a caption that doesn't make sense. They're like, fucking print it. Who cares? We'll, so, we'll uh, fix it when we reprint it. <laughs> so um, that, reprinting, eventually, will come good, you know. <laughs> so I found that page. It's uh, page uh, 102 in Fruit Issue 1813. If you're on YouTube, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. Um, but if you're listening to it on audio, you might want to dig out uh, Fruit Issue 1813 and go to page 102. Or check out the trade paperback. Yes. Yep. Or it's in the trade paperback. Yeah, good point. It might have been reprinted again. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, they Maybe fixed they fixed If there's it. a difference between the two versions. Yeah, that would be yeah. interesting. Yeah. Something I always liked about your colours, Jason, um, is that they do draw the eye. Like, um, the oh, I don't know if big or bold, but, and, and simple is not the right word either, but there's not many colours. And the colours that you use, well, for me, anyway, um, draw the eye to different elements of the of the frame or of the, of the picture. Like um, you'll have a like a person, for example, and it won't be like a, a skin tone and, and, a, and another color for his hat and, and clothes. He will all he'll all be blue or something like that. But he's not a main character. He's not. Where, you just need to know that he's there. Your your main focus is what wants to be on the other guy who you put more detail or something rather in, into the color. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Steve, for that. I think the word you're looking for is lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I was, you know what, so you're doing the lettering, you're doing a grey version, uh, you, you, you're you getting paid a certain amount and then you've got to colour it. And it's like, oh, all right. So I don't like sitting down and, and colouring. It's very, very time-consuming. But... Uh, I do happen to like the colouring in the old DC comics from the 70s and the 60s, which I grew up reading, and I don't like um, uh, fancy computer colouring where it's over-rendered and there's lens flares and there's blending and all that, though there is a place for that. I use it myself, particularly on the covers where the cover stock is slick and it will support fine blended colour and modelling and that stuff. However, on the interior... Yeah, I'm glad you like it. I'm amazed when people say they like my colours because it's it's it was a real problem for me. How am I going to turn in decent looking colour pages and not break my neck doing all the the intricate colouring that Ivan Pedersen is famous for and does a such great job? Green tree, blue tree, uh, brown tree trunk, blue sky, green tree, blue sky, green water. Mm. You do that every panel. My God. You, you'll just you'll you'll shoot yourself in the head. I would, <laughs> I would. So you go back to the old seventies comics, and they had to really work within a very limited color palette, and they couldn't model every character. There's no way they could model a crowd scene like you can with a computer now, and it doesn't even work that well anyway because you, you, as you say, the eye does get lost. The artist has already gone crazy drawing all the little faces in the crowd and and all the details there and all you're going to do is make it more obscured with with um day glow technical color yawn coloring so and i also like to use flat bright colors so it's a color comic it's exciting you're a kid you you know you've bought a color comic because there's a red thing there and there's a gr bright green thing there, not too bright. Like I, I actually knock the red back. I knock the green back because otherwise it hits people in the face too much, particularly like on the annual where they've got slick paper on the inside. And I, and I, I thought some of the, the pages I did were probably a little bit too contrasty. But, you know, I like that as a kid. I like seeing lots of big, flat, juicy colours on mm. the page. There certainly wasn't a lot of modelling and stuff like that, you know. So, and, and even if I do, even if I try and do the foreground background thing where the foreground characters are all in blue and then they're in 
full color in the background. I'll, I will try and put a bit of modeling, simple modeling on the blue guy. I'll put a bit of a dark shade down the side of his face and may, or maybe just a, a little highlight. So it looks like I, I care. I do care. I do care about your experience, but I just can't be Ivan Pedersen. I just can't do it. I don't know how it does it. I remember, I remember that issue, the 1883. I remember we all talked about how we enjoyed the colours. Um, yeah, I was so, yeah. I'm sorry, mate. I was really waiting for people to slam me on the colours because I know there's colourists out there that really want to work in comics and they just use every trick in the book. They, they throw everything they can at, at, at comic colouring and it just doesn't work. It just doesn't yeah. look like a comic anymore. I suppose the colour has to has to add or like go with the black and white in a, or the line art in a sense. And sometimes if the colours are too funky, it can kind of draw away and it can just become a mess. Well, my stuff's pretty detailed. If you had a, an mm -hmm. artist where they're deliberately getting out of the way and leaving lots of space for the colourist because they know the colourist is really going to do a great job on this sunset or this foliage, if that's their thing, and they step out of the way and the colorist has a space, that, that might be different. But my stuff's fairly detailed, and, and by the time I get to the color, I just, I've, run out of, I've run out of ideas. I've already done the best foliage I can possibly do. Like, mm. I, do like fol I do like doing backgrounds. I like doing backgrounds in comics. I reward the reader. By, by doing some cool-looking jungle vines and, and I dig out my old Bern Hogarth uh, Tarzans and, oh, man, he did the best vines. I used to love the way he's not only got the vines but he's got the, the goo dripping from, I don't know what the goo is, but it looks cool dripping off the vines and you've got to have a bit of that work in there and do some Wallywood tree trunks and, you know. So I've already thought of all that. It's all taken care of. Mm. So mm. a colorist working for me would be bored stiff. Mm. <laughs> well, it sounds <laughs> like he is. <laughs> like, <take> that up. <laughs> <laughs> I do care and I do take care to make sure it's inside the lines. You know what I mean? Oh. It's not going outside the lines. That's hard, man. You're sitting there. Oh, Christ. It's all <laughs> like so you do your colouring by computer then, you've said. Do you, yeah. What about your original uh, line work? Is that uh, pen, and, pen and paper still, or, you know, uh, ink and brush, or, or are you straight on to the, the screen with the Syntac or, or um, whatever the modern artist is using? Uh, on Eek, when I did the first Eek trade paperback, um, I was working as a graphic designer and doing Eek at work behind my boss's back. <laughs> I was so bored. And I, I went <coughs> crazy on the Cintiq and I sort of did what Glenn's doing now and I just go right in and do all the detail and I just couldn't physically do it anymore. I just, I just couldn't. And um, some of the detail work I was doing wasn't translating to the page very well anyway. Um, and, and, and some of my favourite artists are loose and energetic and, um, and I, I, I like getting some of that energy on the page via just... Oh, just marker pens, just nothing fancy, no brushes. I can use a brush. I've, I've used everything. I can paint, um, all that stuff. Um, but I do like to, to, to get the, the job done and, um, and without um, sort of uh, slowing down too much, yeah, I, I like the energy of, of, of pens and traditional mm. media. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it is quicker. It is quicker. You do get bogged down a bit with, with computer inking. Mm. But I've looked at some of my old computer inking horror stuff and it's 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 unreal. I'm just like, oh fuck that. I'll never get that. I'll never get that level of of, of intensity with traditional media. But I, I still do pretty good. You know, I'm mm. I'm happy with the work I'm doing. I'm proud of it. Sometimes you look at it like you look at it particularly when it's publishing, oh god, I wish I'd given that another pass, you know. Sometimes you're tired or sometimes you're sore. I, I think sometimes with me, I just want to get away from the drawing board. I must be just like cramping up. So, and and I, I can see it in the page sometimes. Oh, I was tired. I was sore that day. I'm just not liking it. I must, mustn't have been liking it, mm. you know. Well, certainly um, the, the energy is still there. And I think that, mm. uh, you know, I mentioned um, 
catching you up at a, uh, catching up with you at cons before, but uh, just seeing you bring out folders of your originals and go through those. I mean, there, there's certainly energy and dynamicism in in what you're producing with the traditional media. Don't worry about that. Yeah, you're never gonna. You, everything you do is it's never going to be perfect. You're always going to have dud panels and dud pages. You just can't get. You know, comics is about you are supposed to churn it. You are supposed to produce. You know, um, it's great having guys like Glenn Lumsden who can do those real feature stories and we all wait for them and like the Brian Bolland stuff. Oh, wow. And you wait for this amazing story, but you, you need guys like me also who, who are going to produ- produce, you know, I just wish they could publish it as fast as I can draw it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have me doing everything. You've got to have other artists, you know, that wouldn't be fair. Mm. And you know, our wives. Other guys. <laughs> our wives are happy that the comic's well, gone back to, to, to Fortnite. What's that? What's that? I was just going to say, our wives are happy that it's only a Fortnite comic as well. <laughs> yeah. Not weekly. Yeah. But, I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, I as much as I think I could do a regular book, I probably couldn't. I mean, I'd probably end up in traction. Like, physically, I'm mean, 52. Physically, I can't. Yeah. I can't. I couldn't. I mean, I can go fast for a while. Then I have to have a rest. You know, I yeah. can't. The guys that go every day, it's not healthy. I mean, not just not just because of your muscle cramps and stuff, because of your heart, you, your fucking diet. You, you know, you've got to, you know, comic artists in the, back in the day were notorious for just chain smoking all day and just being chained to the drawing board, earning crap money and having to churn out page after page, chain smoking every day. And it's a it's a very sedentary job too, isn't it? You've got to you know yeah. you, you must have times where you feel like you've just got to walk around and uh, spend a day, as you say, away from the desk. I'm sitting on an orthopedic chair. I'm on a kneeling chair, and it's it's not fun. But if I don't use one of them, I just couldn't sit down. I couldn't I couldn't sit down for this long. Yeah, right. You move the pain around. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like moving around. <laughs> So Dan, uh, Dan made mention of um, folders of original art. Um, you do sell your original art, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I own one. Yep. I own a page. Um, so if people are interested, they can uh, contact you. Yeah, I put I put heaps of it up on Facebook, um, but the recent published stuff <clears throat> may not be there. <clears throat> but there's a ton of it on Facebook. If you just go to my Facebook page and trawl through it, I've taken fairly bad uh, photographs of the pages, just flicked through, and I've numbered the pages and I've, I've written what story they're from. So yep. people can look at that and then tell me what page they want and I can actually find it and then mark sold on it. So yep. if you look through it, it says sold. Yes, it's been sold. If it hasn't got sold on it, then it hasn't been sold. And I am paying attention and I can track what page it is, hmm. you know. So, Stephen, I know you've got a, a page. I've got a page as well. Um, Dan, do you have any? Well, now to make that's a way to make me feel awkward, Jim. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry, Jason. <laughs> you've got you've got yeah. the hair. You've got the um uh, the Kickstarter book. Though. Yeah, that's exactly right. I support the Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, you know, any more of those? Any more of those books available? I've got plenty of them back here. Oh, right. I, got a, I could do a whole stall probably if I ever do another convention <coughs> and get my own table. I definitely fill it up. Pretty by now, I definitely fill it up. Yeah, we'll look forward to a day when we can go have conventions again. Yeah. Oh goodness. Right. And so, if people want commissions as well, they can contact you as well. Yeah, I recently did uh, one for Sam Malazzo, who enjoys. Uh, <laughs> Phantom bear hugging, other bear. Oh, hugging. that fella! <laughs> oh, Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, he's very happy with his uh, Phantom Commission. Uh, great fun doing it. So yeah, I'm definitely up for a bit of fun on Phantom Commissions. Definitely. No worries. Well, well, maybe we might have to ask Sam if we can show the, yeah, uh, that fast, commission. So that, that's that's one thing where being fast was probably is probably a calling card. Whereby, yes, you will get it. <laughs> yeah, I've I'm waiting on four years for one commission. So. Yeah, I've heard I've heard lots of stories like that, and I, I don't know any artists who who do that. I mean, I don't really know any 
comic artists really except for Glenn Lumsden who are currently doing comics. Um, but, yeah, you, you see stuff on Facebook from people in the States and um, I, don't, I, I don't really get a lot of commissions so I can afford to be, you know, uh, relaxed about it. But I guess if you've got a big list of stuff that you're working through, but I wouldn't take people's money. I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, take people's money if they're on a big list. You know what I mean? Mm. Like take your time to do it, but don't take their money. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You made mention of painting before as well. You donated a um, a gaslight painting to one of the dinners as well. That was yeah. that was a very nice piece. So I think, um, yeah, it will be uh, any more phantom paintings on the horizon. Yeah, yeah, or... uh, yeah I've got a, a skateboard. I did a phantom skateboard. Um, as in, you painted the underside of a skateboard of the yeah. deck. Did you post that on Facebook, Jason? I have a feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring Did you show us up? again? Someone was talking, so, yeah, awesome. So if you're on YouTube, That's you'll be able to see that. Yep. Acrylic on a blank deck. Um, I've done a few of those, different subjects. I've got a hair but one here. Um, <clears throat> it's come out all right. Oh, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, but... It's a bit glary, that one. There's a lot of detail in it. Um, but do you do those just for your own, um, just for fun for yourself, Jason, to be then hanging them on the wall? And... Yeah, I'm probably going to exhibit them at some stage because we've got a bunch. And I do sort of comic-related canvases as well. Like, that's Charlie's Angels in Space. It's kind of, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. Sort of Glen Bar sort of style, sort of stuff, you know. Oh, wow. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So yeah, I I like to paint. I'd like to do some more stuff like that. It's just finding space to put them. You know, finding places to put them. It's hard to store. I'm running out of space, basically. Can't should've, keep building sheds. Should have should have built a bigger cool. shed. Yeah. I'm not allowed. <laughs> um well I've I've really enjoyed having you on uh tonight. It's been it's been a blast. I know um uh, me and Dan have uh told the story a couple of times about uh at a convention one Sunday, I believe it was. Uh, the three of us just stood around talking for probably about two, three hours, and it was it was it was a great time. Yeah. Um, um, so one of the things I do want to talk about before we do go is um, you've you've released a Phantom song, and oh, you've yeah. talked you've talked about how you're a musician as well. Um, yeah. And so we've currently got a, a competition on our website that um, to create a fan, a video clip to go with the Phantom song. So we will end we will end the podcast with your song. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so could you just tell us a bit about the song? Um, you know, what was the the story behind it? Uh, I, I did it to embarrass my kids mainly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my dad's doing anything, isn't it? They like the song. <laughs> they sing it around the house. They we, 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 <clears throat> they invented a, a rude R-rated version of the song. Which I won't repeat here. <laughs> that's the one that gets sung around the breakfast table to, to wind up dad. Um, but uh, I was trying to figure out how to record music on my computer. So um, I needed material. And uh, I always thought that um, maybe putting something together with, with, you know, on video with maybe um, a montage of some art work or something might be the easy way to go so um that would probably be the easiest way to to do a clip for it is by having still i mean it's it can be quite effective when they uh you know they do animatic sort of style fairly cheap style but effective animation where you've got certain elements moving in and out but it's basically still artwork you know you're just yeah. you're just sort of yeah. playing with the still artwork so it's something that I thought might be a fun project to do to combine my music and my art, but um, I don't know how to do it. So if anyone uh, is any good at putting artwork onto a screen and making it move somehow or, or making the text come in and out, 
you know, I just thought it'd be a fun project, but it's one that's sort of out of my skill set at the moment. <laughs> it was hard enough getting the getting them getting my guitar playing to sound up because I'm not a guitarist really. I've only recently taken up guitar. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a drummer, you know. So um, the the whole thing was just me sort of learning at how to um, sort of have have a bit more fun with other instruments, you know. Mm. Well, Stephen, I believe you've started. Um uh, working on your video clip is that correct? I had I had a bit of a plan yesterday and then I woke up and I thought oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to accomplish that and then I had another idea this morning so <laughs> and then I went and made pizza and stuff later <laughs> I haven't actually done anything I've just had a few plans I've nutted a few things down I actually I went so far yesterday and, and to say all right so that's the lyric there and I actually like time stamped it as I'm listening to it oh, yep, so 44 seconds that's when that he says that Oh, and yeah, just wrote all the lyrics down. So I, I could have that kind of happen. And yeah, I've, I've got a couple of ideas and we'll see what happens. It, it'd probably be helpful if I supplied some art files to people so that they wouldn't have to scan the books. But I mean, look, even if, even if people filmed themselves, you know, running around their backyard in a phantom outfit, that would be totally awesome. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've come up with something that's within my skill set. So <laughs> yeah, well, hey, was, that, that's <laughs> crossed my mind that's too. About, that's about all I can do. <laughs> project, you know, film a video in your backyard with your kids and your dog. Yeah. <laughs> your horse. <laughs> awesome. Well, there you go. So uh, the, the sound file is on our website as well as there's no end date to the competition, so to speak. Uh, so go out there, give it a go. Or if you've got uh, younger kids, you know, maybe get them to do it. Or I know some uh, kids have to do video clips and stuff for school projects. So maybe they can have a go at doing a, um, uh, a, a fancy video clip for a school project as well. Oh, yeah. Um, That's it for sure. Yeah. Uh, Dan, Stephen, do you have any uh, final questions? Oh, I'd just say thank you so much for your time, Jason. It's been an absolute um, pleasure chatting with you. I knew before um, before we started, you know, that this is one that I've been looking forward to ever since we had that long chat at the con a few years ago. At uh, um, right from the get go, you've been uh, up and about and entertaining to talk to, and I really hope that well, it's the the, the energy that you bring to your page is you, you can see where it comes from. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm a speedy guy, <laughs> <laughs> energetic and dynamic, mate. Oh, but, like, you're <laughs> You're very self-deprecating, and we uh, we love that. But um, I think uh, your work is is outstanding, and uh, we're all the better for that it's relationship cool, that you cool. with Bedford all those years ago, and uh, the it coming in, into fruition now with uh, with the work that we're seeing in um, in their Phantom comics. Cheers, thanks, guys. Much I just rem- I can't say anything yeah. any more than what Dan has. I was going to say, yeah, 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 the energy that you bring to the page, and you're up and about <laughs> here on, here on the screen. So. Uh, yeah, energy personified. It's been, t- been great talking with you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. I remember you and Jamie Johnson sitting together at the um, yeah, convention. Yeah, me and too. Yous, yous were kind of like the the naughty school kids at the back of the oh, class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were pushing it a bit that day, I think, with uh, some of the booth members. But uh, <laughs> I've always been very community-minded about comics, so I, I always come in like, hey, well, hey guys, we're, you know, we're all... Uh, all in it together type thing but you know mm. well as as the three of us fans we're, we've enjoyed your energy on the drawing but also in talking to you at, at conventions as well so um yeah so uh is there anything that we've not made mention of or a question you wish we had asked or anything like that um no just just um if anyone wants to hit me up on facebook uh there's tons more art and stuff stretching back years really mm. um so if anyone wants to see more artwork they can private message me I'm, I'm always happy to show previews or progress shots of what i'm working on and more stuff out of the unpublished file i'm just going to keep pushing that in front of people and uh hopefully the powers that be will <laughs> will hear <laughs> my plea i'll get the not so subtle hint (laughs) before something happens and it's all you know it all changes i don't know historically sometimes things get uh i don't know maybe maybe there'll be a time where you know certain characters aren't cool to be used or who knows who knows Mm -hmm. how fickle fortune works out so i hate to see it all just get sort of you know 
sidelines. Forgotten about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, you can find out more about us on our website, which is chroniclechamber.com. Our email address is chroniclechamber at gmail.com. Uh, you can subscribe to all our podcasts on the various uh, programs like iTunes, Spotify, or uh, various Android apps like Podbean, Player FM, CastBox, Listen Notes, or you can also watch us on youtube as well um so from myself thank you jason thank you listeners for listening to us hope you listen to it and happy fandoming over and out happy fandoming everyone happy fandoming